Pineapple Pizza Podcast discusses the histories, cultures, and beliefs of regions around the world. These stories often contain mature and sometimes disturbing content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Oh my god, have you guys seen that new movie? Oh god, what is the name of it? The Mitchells versus the Machines. Oh my god. (laughs) Dog, pig, dog, pig, pig, dog, pig, bread, (laughs) bread. When the mom gets so pissed off at the end, I lost my shit. I was like, that is 100% a mom. <laughs> That's my little boy. <laughs> and she goes full roadhouse on the robot and like rips out its gears. I fucking love Maya Rudolph. <laughs> oh, God. That movie is so good. We watched it again the other night and I was like, this movie is pure gold. It is. Ashley, if you haven't seen it, you are going to have the humor in it. You need to watch it. If, okay. you can, if you need to pick me up, please just watch that movie. Mm-hmm. Within, within the first five minutes, you're going to be like, yes, yes. I'm sure I'll love it. I'm like binge rewatching the Umbrella Academy right now because <laughs> um, number five is going to be an episode of Scarlet. Oh, nice. <laughs> mm. For the uh, Kennedy assassination? No, um, it's going to be for the Trotsky assassination. Oh, okay. But we were like, uh, what am I going to do this time? Because I've already done so many assassinations now. And I was like, no, no. <laughs> Number five, murdering people with an axe. Yes, that's going to happen. <laughs> and a butter knife. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and a tie. Yes. <laughs> Number there five is go. scary deadly. I am number five, and I'm worried about it, but it's probably okay. (laughs) Ridiculous amounts of caffeine later. Yep, it's me. If I were a little boy. (laughs) (laughs) An old man in a little boy's body. That would be me. No, I'm just thinking, I'm like, if I were a young man. Oh my god, are we going to do Fiddler on the Roof? Ugh. I don't know any of the other songs from Fiddler on the Roof. I don't either. That's all I know. Matchmaker, matchmaker. Oh, make yeah. Me match. Find me a find. Catch me catch. Me catch. catch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, let's get crazy. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Welcome to Pineapple Pizza Podcast, where we serve up delicious slices of mythology, cryptozoology, and urban legends. It's an interesting combination of flavors. Weird, but it works. Today's special is a... (laughs) Holy shit. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god. I was Um, not prepared for that. Wow, now I feel like I need to go hog tie something. <laughs> I had to do it. I'll go get one of the neighbor's goats. I'll there you go. Tie it. <laughs> I'm your hostess, Lindsay, and with me are the amazing and awe inspiring Ashley and Emily. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> hey. I'm not sure we can live up to it after after that intro. You know what? We can. We just need to snort some llama and everything will be That's fine. True. Yep. That's true. Llama, it's the cocaine you never knew existed. <laughs> <laughs> and never knew you needed. <laughs> so I'm very excited because today's dishes are a collection of terrifying tales from some of the world's most famous siblings, the Brothers Grimm. Ooh. I can't see my face, but I'm like psychotically smiling because I'm so excited. She is so excited that I'm currently worried that like I should probably have pre-booked five years of therapy. Like that's what I'm witnessing. Okay. Today I'm going to share a few truly fucked up stories from Do it. Grimm's complete fairy tales. And I got this book from my seventh grade German teacher. Frau Tonsfeld, from her own private collection upon her retirement. Dang. And the book was compiled by Nelson Doubleday and contains 211 fairy tales. They wrote that many fairy tales? Yep. Holy cow, I had no idea. 
So I'm going to share three of my favorites along with some information about the brothers themselves. So the brothers, whose last names were actually Grimm, were born in the late 18th century in Hanau, Germany. Jacob Ludwig Karl Grimm was born January 4th, 1785, and his younger brother Wilhelm Karl Grimm was born the following year on February 24th, 1786. They were two of nine children. Oh, nope. <laughs> yeah. Too many. <laughs> Sorry, Frau Grimm. Yeah. And two of the eldest that survived past infancy. So they had yeah. one older brother. That's why you had to have so many. You needed the extra ones. Yep. Oh. So of those that survived, the pair were two of five brothers and they had one sister. So their parents were Philip Wilhelm Grimm who was a jurist, or what today we would consider to be a judge or a lawyer. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And Dorothea Zimmergrim. They were educated by private tutors that raised them as strict Lutherans. Their father passed away in 1796 from pneumonia, and as a result, the family became quite poor, requiring their mother to regularly depend on support from her father and her sister. Ugh, sucks. Their eldest brother, Jacob, had to take on the responsibilities of the man of the house at the age of 11, and the pair would regularly help him to ensure they could keep a roof over their heads. That's rough yeah. for kids. Yeah. It is, but sadly, we did not really care what happened to women if their husband died. We yeah. just did not. We were like, well, guess you should have thought about that and married a different husband, even though you probably didn't get to pick the first one. Yep. Uh, the brothers, who were particularly bright, were sent to Kassel to attend Friedrichs Gymnasium, which is a school that was paid for by their aunt. And that's basically just like a high school. So while there, even though it was readily apparent to them that they were quite poor compared to their contemporaries, the pair excelled at their studies, which included language and the arts. In fact, both brothers graduated at the head of their classes, Jacob in 1803 and Wilhelm in 1804. The jerk in me thinks it's really easy to focus on your studies when you don't have any money, so there's nothing else to entertain you. That's pretty much what happened, yeah. Wow, I feel like you just burned my childhood, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was one of those things, too, where they weren't really allowed into any extracurricular activities. So mm -hmm. that's kind of what they did, is they just focused on their studies. Yep. Probably didn't have anybody to hang out with. They were the poor kids. And it was one of those things, too, where since their aunt was providing for their education, I'm sure they felt a little bit like they had to mm. um, repay her kindness by taking their studies seriously. Yeah. So I'm sure that was a lot of it, too. So this first story is The Goose Girl. And when reading this collection, this story stuck with me for a number of reasons, particularly the imagery it invokes, not to mention the penalty that comes to the villain of this story is the stuff of nightmares. So that mm -hmm. being said, I present to you The Goose Girl. There was once upon a time an old queen whose husband had been dead for many years, and she had a beautiful daughter. When the princess grew up, she was betrothed to a prince who lived at a great distance. When the time came for her to be married, and she had to journey forth into the distant kingdom, the aged queen packed up for her many costly vessels of silver and gold, and trinkets also of gold and silver, and cups and jewels, in short, everything which appertained to a royal dowry, for she loved her child with all her heart. She likewise sent her maiden-waiting, who was to ride with her, and hand her over to the bridegroom, and each had a horse for the journey, but the horse of the king's daughter was called Falada, and could speak. So when the hour of parting had come, the aged mother went into her bedroom, took a small knife, and cut her finger with it until it bled. Then she held a white handkerchief to it, into which she let three drops of blood fall, gave it to her daughter, and said, Dear child, preserve this carefully. It will be of service to you on your way. That's blood magic. Yeah, blood magic's bad magic. Ask Daenerys. So they took a sorrowful leave of each other. The princess put the piece of cloth in her bosom. 
mounted her horse, and then went away to her bridegroom. After she had ridden for a while, she felt a burning thirst and said to her waiting maid, Dismount and take my cup, which you have brought for me, and get me some water from the stream, for I should like to drink. If you are thirsty, said the waiting maid, get off your horse yourself and lie down and drink out of the water. I don't choose to be your servant. Oh, Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) That's a sick burn. Right? (laughs) Bitch, get it yourself. (laughs) So in her great thirst, the princess alighted, bent down over the water in the stream and drank, and was not allowed to drink out of the golden cup. Then she said, Ah, heaven. And the three drops of blood answered, If your mother knew this, her heart would break. But the king's daughter was humble, said nothing, and mounted her horse again. She rode some miles further, but the day was warm. The sun scorched her, and she was thirsty once more. And when they came to a stream of water, she again cried to her waiting maid, Dismount and give me some water in my golden cup. For she had long ago forgotten the girl's ill words. I wouldn't, but whatever. Right? (laughs) But the waiting maid said still more haughtily, If you wish to drink, drink as you can. I don't choose to be your maid. Then in her great thirst, the king's daughter alighted, bent over the flowing stream, wept, and said, Ah, heaven. And the drops of blood again replied, If your mother knew this, her heart would break. Why do the... Why are the drops of blood sentient? I don't know. It's a fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> Disney on an acid trip right here. Yeah. <laughs> and as she was thus drinking and leaning right over the stream, the handkerchief with the three drops of blood fell out of her bosom and floated away with the water without her observing it. So great was her trouble. She didn't hear them screaming. Ah! Apparently not, <laughs> as she was gurgling down a bunch of water. Oh, God. Gulp, I have gulp. a lot of follow-up questions about how they <laughs> fell out of her bosom, but whatever. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> well, if, if she was crying, she might have taken it out and was, like, dabbing her eyes and then didn't put it back in her bosom properly. I've never had anything just fall out of my bosom. But I mean, fun. I haven't either, but <laughs> I typically don't store things there either, so. <laughs> it's not where you keep your spare set of keys or anything. No, I don't typically oh. use it as a pocket. Oh, sweaty keys. Oh. Hot pocket. Ew. 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 <laughs> the waiting maid, however, had seen it. And she rejoiced to think that she had now power over the bride. For since the princess had lost the drops of blood, she had become weak and powerless. So now, when she wanted to mount her horse again, the one that was called Falada, the waiting maid said, Falada is more suitable for me, and my nag will do for you. And the princess had to be content with that. Then the waiting maid, with many hard words, bade the princess exchange her royal apparel for her own shabby clothes. Mm, I can see where this is going. (laughs) And at length, she was compelled to swear by the clear sky above her that she would not say one word of this to anyone at the royal court. And if she had not taken this oath, she would have been killed on the spot. But Falada saw all this and observed it well. The waiting maid now mounted Falada, and the true bride, the bad horse. And thus they traveled onwards until at length they entered the royal palace. There were great rejoicings over her arrival, and the prince sprang forward to meet her, lifted the waiting maid from her horse, and thought she was his consort. She was conducted upstairs, but the real princess was left standing below. Then the old king looked out of the window and saw her standing in the courtyard, and how dainty and delicate and beautiful she was, and instantly went to the royal apartment and asked the bride about the girl she had with her, who was standing down below in the courtyard, and who she was. I picked her up on my way for a companion. Give the girl something to work at, that she may not stand idle. But the old king had no work for her, and knew of none. So he said, I have a little boy who tends the geese. She may help him. The boy was called Conrad, and the true bride had to help him tend the geese. Soon afterwards, the false bride said to the young king, Dearest husband, I beg you to do me a favor. He answered, 
I will do so most willingly. Then send for the knacker, and have the head of the horse on which I rode here cut off, for it vexed me on the way. In reality, she was afraid that the horse might tell how she had behaved to the king's daughter. Then she succeeded in making the king promise that it should be done, and the faithful Falada was to die. This came to the ears of the real princess, and she secretly promised to pay the knacker a piece of gold if he would perform a small service for her. There was a great dark-looking gateway in, ta- in the town, through which morning and evening she had to pass with the geese. Would he be so good as to nail up Falada's head on it, so that she might see him again more than once? Ew. Yeah. Ew on so many levels. The knacker's man promised to do that and cut off the head and nailed it fast beneath the dark gateway. Early in the morning, when she and Conrad drove out their flock beneath this gateway, she said in passing, Alas, Falada, hanging there. Then the head answered, Yep, it's one of those stories. Mm -mm. No, I don't like this. (laughs) Alas, young queen, how ill you fare. If this your tender mother knew, her heart would surely break in two. He even rhymes. He's a rhyming horse. Then they went still further out of the town and drove their geese into the country. And when they had come to the meadow, she sat down and unbound her hair, which was like pure gold. And Conrad saw it and delighted in its brightness and wanted to pluck out a few hairs. No, that hurts, you fucker. (laughs) Yeah, he's like an evil little boy. Then she said, blow, blow, thou gentle wind, I say. Blow Conrad's little hat away and make him chase it here and there until I have braided all my hair and bound it up again. And there came such a violent wind that it blew Conrad's hat far away across country, and he was forced to run after it. When he came back, she had finished combing her hair and was putting it up again, and he could not get any of it. Then Conrad was angry and would not speak to her, and thus they watched the geese until the evening, and then they went home. Next day, when they were driving the geese out through the dark gateway, the maiden said, Alas, Falada, hanging there. Falada answered, Alas, young queen, how ill you fare. If this your tender mother knew, her heart would surely break in two. And she sat down again in the field and began to comb out her hair. And Conrad ran and tried to clutch it. So she said in haste, Blow, blow, thou gentle wind, I say. Blow Conrad's little hat away and make him chase it here and there until I have braided all my hair and bound it up again. Then the wind blew and blew his little hat off his head and far away, and Conrad was forced to run after it. And when he came back, her hair had been put up a long time, and he could get none of it. And so they looked after their geese till evening came. But in the evening, after they had got got home, Conrad went to the old king and said, I won't tend the geese with that girl any longer. Why not? inquired the aged king. Oh, because she vexes me the whole day long. Then the aged king commanded him to relate what it was that she did to him. And Conrad said, In the morning, when we pass beneath the dark gateway with the flock, there is a sorry horse's head on the wall, and she says to it, Alas, Falada, hanging there. And the head replies, Alas, young queen, how ill you fare. If this your tender mother knew, her heart would surely break in two. And Conrad went on to relate what happened on the goose pasture, and how, when there, he had to chase his hat. The aged king commanded him to drive his flock out again next day, and as soon as morning came, he placed himself behind the dark gateway, and heard how the maiden spoke to the head of Falada. And then he too went into the country and hid himself in the thicket in the meadow. There he soon saw with his own eyes the goose girl and the goose boy bringing their flock, and how after a while she sat down and unplaited her hair, which shone with radiance. And soon she said, Blow, blow, thou gentle wind, I say. Blow Conrad's little hat away, and make him chase it here and there, until I have braided all my hair and bound it up again. Then came a blast of wind and carried off Conrad's hat, so that he had to run far away, while the maiden quietly went on combing and plaiting her hair, all of which the king observed. 
Then, quite unseen, he went away, and when the goose girl came home in the evening, he called her aside and asked why she did all these things. I may not tell you that, and I dare not lament my sorrows to any human being, for I have sworn not to do so by the heaven which is above me. If I had not done that, I should have lost my life. He urged her and left her no peace, but he could draw nothing from her. And then he said he, If you will not tell me anything, tell your sorrows to the iron stove there. And he went away. Then she crept into the iron stove and began to weep and lament and emptied her whole heart and said, Here I am deserted by the whole world, and yet I am a king's daughter and a false waiting maid has by force brought me to such a pass that I have been compelled to put off my royal apparel, and she has taken my place with the bridegroom, and I have to perform menial service as a goose girl. If my mother did but know that, her heart would break. The aged king, however, was standing outside by the pipe of the stove and was listening to what she said and heard it. Then he came back again and bade her come out of the stove. The royal garments were placed on her, and it was marvelous how beautiful she was. The aged king summoned his son and revealed to him that he had got the false bride, who was only a waiting maid, but that the true one was standing there as the sometime goose girl. The young king rejoiced with all his heart when he saw her beauty and youth, and a great feast was made ready to which all the people and all good friends were invited. At the head of the table sat the bridegroom with the king's daughter at one side of him and the waiting maid on the other. But the waiting maid was blinded and did not recognize the princess in her dazzling array. When they had eaten and drunk and were merry, the aged king asked the waiting maid as a riddle what a person deserved who had behaved in such and such a way to her master, and at the same time related the whole story and asked what sentence such as such an one merited. Then the false bride said, She deserves no better fate than to be stripped entirely naked and put in a barrel which is studded inside with pointed nails, and two white horses should be harnessed to it, which will drag her along through one street after another till she is dead. It is you, said the aged king, and you have pronounced your own sentence. And thus shall it be done unto you. When the sentence had been carried out, the young king married his true bride, and both of them reigned over their kingdom in peace and happiness. Oh my god, that's dark. Mm-hmm. That ending, oh my, that's like Game of Thrones style torture. Mm-hmm. Joffrey would have done something like that. Jeez. Mm-hmm. It's a horse-drawn Iron Maiden. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yep. It's <laughs> rough. So I mentioned that this story really stuck with me, and I actually used it as an inspiration for a project I did in art school, where we had to share a fairy tale through a series of vignettes that highlighted the major plot points in the story. So yes, I've always been this fucked up. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) I can understand why that one would stick with you. I mean, that's pretty freaking dark when you hear, especially when you're younger, you said seventh grade or something like that. Mm -hmm. When you hear this, your brain just that it probably burned it into your brain. Oh, yeah. So sit tight. I'm going to check on the next course and we'll be right back. Today's episode is brought to you by DB. DB is a Scandinavian brand that makes backpacks and bags to help people on the move stay ready for anything. From the streets to the peaks, DB's gear is travel tested by some of the world's best athletes, adventurers, and creators. Over the past decade, DB has designed and developed, released and refined the best bags in the market. With DB's patented hookup system, you are able to attach smaller products to your backpack, roller, or tote. I know personally, whenever I have to go through the airport, which is something that I hate doing, having to wrestle with multiple bags is a struggle, especially once you start getting through the TSA line. So having an option to just be able to easily attach everything to one bag sounds heavenly. I would have to agree. 
I've been doing a whole bunch of traveling lately for conferences as a grad student, and trying to carry around a whole bunch of bags is a humongous pain in the butt. And it's even more concerning when you have to check something and then you don't know if it's going to make it to your final destination. So having those carry-ons really matters. Being able to easily get from one point to another is a big deal in travel, and DB will help you get there. We are teaming up with DB to exclusively offer our listeners 10% off your next purchase by using the code POD10 or going to the link in our show notes. DB, it's time to move on, time to get going. Thanks for waiting. Careful, this one isn't for the faint of heart. Oh no. After graduating, the brothers looked to pursue a law degree like their father by attending the University of Marburg. Just as in Castle, the pair were treated as inferior to everyone else thanks to their low social standing, which excluded them from a number of social and extracurricular activities. This didn't stop the brothers from putting just as much effort into their studies as they did in Castle. In fact, one of their law professors, a man named Friedrich von Savigny, inspired them to pursue further studies in history, philology, which is the study of language, and medieval German literature. So following their graduation from the University of Marburg, the pair moved to France, specifically Paris, where Jacob worked as a secretary at a royal library in, in Castle. It wasn't even have been Castle. At a royal library, the Royal Library of King Jerome Bonaparte of Westphalia. Oh, Bonaparte. Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. And at the request of Clemens Brentano, who was a German romantic, the brothers began to research folktales with a focus on oral village folklore. Their goal was to compile stories not only from their own country of Germany, but also from Scandinavia, Spain, the Netherlands, Ireland, Scotland, England, Serbia, and Finland. Their means of researching and transcribing these folktales began with the collection of folk songs and folk poetry. The brothers believed that these stories expressed mankind's eternal struggles with hopes and fears, joys and sorrows, and the unceasing pursuit of true happiness. I think that's like a super sunny way of putting it, but all right, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That kind of sounds like how we described mythology, cryptozoology, and urban legends. Like, the whole reason that these stories came about. Yep. The second story today is the robber bridegroom. This story has often been considered one of the most disturbing of all of Grimm's fairy tales, which is probably why it's never been converted into a Disney movie, <laughs> but would probably make a great premise for a horror movie. That said, here is... The Robber Bridegroom. I think I know this one, but I'm not 100% sure, but I'm very excited. <laughs> there was once a miller who had a beautiful daughter, and when she was grown up, he became anxious that she should be well married and taken care of. So he thought, if a decent sort of man comes and asks her in marriage, I will give her to him. Yep, I know this one. <laughs> <laughs> It's got Ashley's stamp of approval. Soon after, a suitor came forward who seemed very well-to-do, and as the miller knew nothing to his disadvantage, he promised him his daughter. Did he have a blue beard? No. 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 <laughs> but the girl did not seem to love him as a bride should love her bridegroom. She had no confidence in him as often as she saw him or thought about him. She felt a chill at her heart. One day he said to her, You are to be my bride, and yet you have never been to see me. The girl answered, I do not know where your house is. Then he said, My house is a long way in the wood. Red flag number one. Yep, never <laughs> go in the woods in a fairy tale. Never. No joke. She began to make excuses and said she could not find the way to it. But the bridegroom said, You must come and pay me a visit next Sunday. I have already invited company, and I will strew ashes on the path through the wood so that you will be sure to find it. When Sunday came and the girl set out on her way, she felt very uneasy without knowing exactly why. 
and she filled both pockets full of peas and lentils. There were ashes strewn on the path through the wood, but nevertheless, at each step, she cast to the right and left a few peas on the ground. So she went on the whole day until she came to the middle of the wood, where it was darkest, and there stood a lonely house, not pleasant in her eyes, for it was dismal and unhomelike. She walked in, but there was no one there, and the greatest stillness reigned. Suddenly she heard a voice cry, Turn back, turn back, thou pretty bride, within this house thou must not bide, for here do evil things be tied. Give me a chill. <laughs> <laughs> You don't even know. (laughs) (laughs) The girl glanced round and perceived that the voice came from a bird who was hanging in a cage by the wall. And again it cried, Turn back, turn back, thou pretty bride. Within this house thou must not bide, for here do evil things be tied. Then the pretty bride went on from one room into another through the whole house, but it was quite empty and no soul to be found in it. At last she reached the cellar, and there sat a very old woman nodding her head. "'Can you tell me,' said the bride, "'if my bridegroom lives here?' "'Oh, poor child,' answered the old woman. "'Do you know what has happened to you? "'You are in a place of cutthroats. "'You thought you were a bride, and soon to be married, "'but death will be your spouse. "'Look here,' I have a great kettle of water to set on, and when once they have you in their power, they will cut you to pieces without mercy, cook you, and eat you, for they are cannibals. Unless I have pity on you and save you, all is over for you. Then the old woman hid her behind a great cask, where she could not be seen. Be as still as a mouse, she said. Do not move or go away, or else you are lost. At night, when the robbers are asleep, we will escape. I have been waiting a long time for an opportunity. No sooner was it settled than the wicked gang entered the house. They brought another young woman with them, dragging her along, and they were drunk and would not listen to her cries and groans. They gave her wine to drink, three glasses full, one of white wine, one of red, and one of yellow, and then they cut her to pieces the poor bride all the while shaking and trembling when she saw what a fate the robbers had intended for her. One of them noticed on the little finger of their victim a golden ring, and as he could not draw it off easily, he took an axe and chopped it off, but the finger jumped away and fell behind the cask on the bride's lap. The robber took up a light to look for it, but he could not find it. Then said one of the others, "'Have you looked behind the great cask?' But the old woman cried, Come to supper and leave off looking till tomorrow. The finger cannot run away. (laughs) (laughs) Then the robbers said the old woman was right, and they left off searching and sat down to eat. And the old woman dropped some sleeping stuff into their wine, so that before long they stretched themselves on the cellar floor, sleeping and snoring. When the bride heard that, she came from behind the cask and had to make her way among the sleepers lying all about on the ground, and she felt very much afraid lest she might awaken any of them. But by good luck she passed through, and the old woman with her, and they opened the door and they made haste to leave that house of murderers. The wind had carried away the ashes from the path, but the peas and lentils had budded and sprung up, and the moonshine upon them showed the way. And they went on through the night, till in the morning they reached the mill. Then the girl related to her father all that had happened to her. When the wedding day came, the friends and neighbors assembled, the miller having invited them, and the bridegroom also appeared. When they were all seated at table, each one had to tell a story. But the bride sat still and said nothing, till at last the bridegroom said to her, "'Now, sweetheart, do you know no story? Tell us something.' She answered, I will tell you my dream. I was going alone through a wood, and I came at last to a house in which there was no living soul, but by the wall was a bird in a cage who cried, Turn back, turn back, thou pretty bride. Within this house thou must not bide, 
for here do evil things betide. And then again it said it, Sweetheart, the dream is not ended. Then I went through all the rooms, and they were all empty, and it was so lonely and wretched. At last I went down into the cellar, and there sat an old, old woman, nodding her head. I asked her if my bridegroom lived in that house, and she answered, Ah, poor child, you have come into a place of cutthroats. Your bridegroom does live here, but he will kill you and cut you in pieces, and then cook and eat you. Sweetheart, the dream is not ended. But the old woman hid me behind a great cask, and no sooner had she done so than the robbers came home, dragging with them a young woman, and they gave her to drink some wine thrice, white, red, and yellow. Sweetheart, the dream is not yet ended. And then they killed her and cut her in pieces. Sweetheart, my dream is not yet ended. And one of the robbers saw a gold ring on the finger of the young woman. And as it was difficult to get off, he took an axe and chopped off the finger, which jumped upwards and then fell behind the great cask on my lap. And here is the finger with the ring. At these words, she drew it forth and showed it to the company. The robber, who during the story had grown deadly white, sprang up and would have escaped, but the folks held him fast and delivered him up to justice. And he and his whole gang were, for their evil deeds, condemned and executed. That's so very wrong turn. Yeah. <laughs> or like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You're like, hey! <laughs> Is somebody I know here? Oh, shit. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> wrong house I'm gonna go over there yep. sometimes you just gotta engage in some light cannibalism in the middle of the woods and that's what I've always said <laughs> <laughs> always huh Ash <laughs> <laughs> when you have a dinner party with friends sometimes you just wanna have people over and you're like what are we all gonna eat I know hey grandma get the stove going <laughs> Ready for the final course? I'll be right back in one moment. Thanks for waiting. Our final dish may remind you of something we've served before. You'll see. Wah -wah. Contrary to popular belief, the brothers, who were actually extremely close and considered one another as friends, extremely close not in that way <laughs> <laughs> not. you did say it would remind us of something else from this show <laughs> you'll see when I get to it they didn't write any of the fairy tales that have been attributed to them so each of the stories that they compiled together such as Rapunzel Little Red Riding Hood Hansel and Gretel The Little Mermaid and Snow White are all stories that they transcribed from oral tradition and as we've discussed quite often on the show, some stories get a little skewed when they are translated from oral to written pieces. Mm -hmm. But the pair took great pains to keep the stories as true to their original narratives as possible, which is why so many of them are so gruesome and barbaric. A major reason that the brothers wanted to transcribe the stories was due to industrialization. Local traditions were changing, and the pair feared these tales would be lost to time if they weren't compiled in a way that would allow them to continue to be enjoyed for generations. The first compilation was published in 1812 under the title Nursery and Household Tales. As many of these stories were passed down by the women of the family as they carried out their chores. It is this collection that comprises what we know as Grimm's Fairy Tales today. The original tellings of the fairy tales were never intended for children at all. The collection of stories regularly included mentions of sex, extreme violence, not to mention incest, cannibalism, and other depravities. There's a reason why they originally did not include illustrations. Just putting that out there. <laughs> Aw, come on. <laughs> Who doesn't want to see someone being chopped into pieces and put in a stew? I enjoy a nice woodcut illustration from time to time. <laughs> I mean, I do too. Especially when it's violent. Woo! <laughs> now this is a work of art. 
<laughs> the guts look so realistic. Look so realistic. Look at that large intestine. <laughs> <laughs> you can almost smell it. It looks like you can just reach out and touch it. The final story today is Fitcher's Bird. This story, although not an exact reinterpretation, has very similar tones to the story of Bluebeard that Ashley shared during her wildcard episode. So that said, here is Fitcher's Bird. Murder! Murder! <laughs> so much murder! <laughs> Your face when you did murder. that. Murder! <laughs> There was once a wizard who used to take the form of a poor man. He went to houses and bagged and caught pretty girls. No one knew whither he carried them, for they were never seen more. One day he appeared before the door of a man who had three pretty daughters. He looked like a poor weak beggar and carried a basket on his back, as if he meant to collect charitable gifts in it. He begged for a little food. And when the eldest daughter came out and was just reaching him a piece of bread, he did but touch her, and she was forced to jump into his basket. Thereupon he hurried away with long strides and carried her away into a dark forest to his house, which stood in the midst of it. Everything in the house was magnificent. He gave her whatsoever she could possibly desire, and said, My darling, thou wilt certainly be happy with me. For thou hast everything thy heart can wish for. I mean, what perfect relationship doesn't start with a forcible abduction? Mm -hmm. Woo! The best one. <laughs> so dreamy. This lasted a few days, and then he said, I must journey forth and leave thee alone for a short time. There are the keys of the house. Thou mayst go every everywhere and look at everything except into one room which this little key here opens, and there I forbid thee to go on pain of death. He likewise gave her an egg, and said, Preserve the egg carefully for me, and carry it continually about with thee, for a great misfortune would arise from the loss of it. Mm. <laughs> Listen, sometimes your husband or abductor or whatever you want to call him is just like carry around this egg and you're like, whatever, dude. All right. <laughs> it just reminds me of like the high school like sex ed. Like, yeah, and this is a baby. Don't break the egg. Yeah, Don't break yeah the egg. like back in the day before they had those god awful dolls that cry. Yeah. Yep. Where you have to like shove the key super hard into their back. Listen, like you're they're beating the baby to death. There's a reason I did not take that class, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I have enough trouble sleeping. Thank you. <laughs> she took the keys and the egg and promised to obey him in everything. When he was gone, she went all around the house from the bottom to the top and examined everything. The rooms shone with silver and gold, and she thought she had never seen such great splendor. At length, she came to the forbidden door, she wished to pass it by, but curiosity let her have no rest. God damn it. I know. <laughs> Us women in our pity little brains having to know what's in rooms. Gosh. <laughs> We're so dumb. We're so simple. <laughs> it's our lady parts. We just can't resist. <laughs> she examined the key. It looked just like any other. She put it in the keyhole and turned it a little, and the door sprang open. But what did she see when she went in? A great bloody basin stood in the middle of the room, and therein lay human beings, dead and hewn to pieces. And hard by was a block of wood, and a gleaming axe lay upon it. She was so terribly alarmed that the egg which she had held in her hand fell into the basin. She got it out and washed the blood off, but in vain. It appeared again in a moment. She washed and scrubbed, but she could not get it out. It was not long before the man came back from his journey, and the first things which he asked for were the key and the egg. She gave them to him, but she trembled as she did so, and he saw at once by the red spots that she had been in the bloody chamber. Since thou hast gone into the room against my will, said he, thou shalt go back into it against thine own. Thy life is ended. He threw her down, dragged her thither by her hair, cut her head off on the block, and hewed her in pieces so that her blood ran on the ground. Then he threw her into the basin with the rest. 
Now I will fetch myself the second, said the wizard. Yep, we're interchangeable. Woo! (laughs) And again, he went to the house in the shape of a poor man and begged. Then the second daughter brought him a piece of bread. He caught her like the first by simply touching her and carried her away. She did not fare better than her sister. Okay, guys, how are you going to fall for the same trick twice? I know you're different people, but it's the same guy. (laughs) You never saw your sister again. Question mark? Just maybe don't do that. It's it's all in our DNA. We're so dumb with our lady parts, we just don't even know what to do. She allowed herself to be led away by her curiosity, opened the door of the bloody chamber, looked in, and had to atone for it with her life on the wizard's return. Then he went and brought the third sister. But she was clever and crafty. When he had given her the keys and the egg... (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm okay. It's just like... (laughs) She's clever, everybody else was an idiot. (laughs) She's so smart, but we caught her and she's the third one and it was the same exact (laughs) trick, but whatever. But she's smart. Like, she wanted to go with the guy. You're the smartest. Oh my god. (laughs) (laughs) That's why we call her Smarty Sarah. When he had given her the keys and the egg and had left her, she first put the egg away with great care, and then she examined the house and at last went into the forbidden room. Alas, what did she behold? Both her sisters lay there in the basin, cruelly murdered and cut in pieces. She began to gather their limbs together and put them in order, head, body, arms, and legs. And when nothing further was lacking, the limbs began to move and unite themselves together. (laughs) The monk! (laughs) Just twists her head back on. Oh, it's cool. That's all you have to do is just put all the pieces right next to each other. Good as new. Good as new. (laughs) That's how science works. (laughs) <laughs> this is why women aren't actually people, right? <laughs> you can kill us. We'll just come back to life if you put us back together. It's not forever. It's yeah. cool. We're basically just clay. Talking mannequin. Yeah. It's fine. Yep. It's good. Yep. So the limbs began to move and unite themselves together, and both the maidens opened their eyes and were once more alive. Then they rejoiced and kissed and caressed each other. Gross. You're probably <laughs> still covered fully in blood. <laughs> Fucking nasty. And you're touching each other. (laughs) You taste so metallic. (laughs) On his arrival, the man at once demanded the keys and the egg. And as he could perceive no trace of any blood on it, he said, Thou hast stood the test. Thou shalt be my bride. So this was just like a test this whole time. Like, he didn't even marry the bitches. He was just like, you're dead. Okay. Bye. He now had no longer any power over her and was forced to do whatsoever she desired. Oh, very well, said she. Thou shalt first take a basket full of gold to my father and mother, and carry it thyself on thy back. In the meantime, I will prepare for the wedding. Then she ran to her sisters, whom she had hidden in a little chamber, and said, The moment has come when I can save you. The wretch shall himself carry you home again, but as soon as you are at home, send help to me. She put both of them in a basket and covered them quite over with gold, so that nothing of them was to be seen. Then she called in the wizard and said to him, Now carry the basket away, but I shall look through my little window and watch to see if thou stoppest on the way to stand or to rest. Emily's face. (laughs) Isn't gold heavy? That's what I was thinking. It's okay. Covering them quite over with gold. No, no, it's okay. Because the basket's like the TARDIS. It's bigger on the inside. And so everything fits and everything's fine. But they're still going to be heavy. Who gives a shit? He's an asshole. (laughs) And he's a wizard. (laughs) Just slowly dragging them through the woods, like, thump over each rock. If he breaks his spine on the way there, I don't have a problem with that. (laughs) That's true. Whoops. (laughs) In fact, the next part says, The wizard raised the basket on his back and went away with it, but it weighed him down so heavily that the perspiration streamed from his face. Then he sat down and wanted to rest a while, but immediately one of the girls in the basket cried, I am looking through my little window, and I see that thou art resting. Wilt thou go on at once? 
He thought his bride was calling back to him and got up on his legs again. Once more, he was going to sit down, but instantly she cried, I am looking through my little window and I see that thou art resting. Wilt thou go on directly? Whenever he stood still, she cried this, and then he was forced to go onwards until at last, groaning and out of breath, he took the basket with the gold and the two maidens into their parents' house. At home, however, the bride prepared the marriage feast and sent invitations to the friends of the wizard. Then she took a skull with grinning teeth, put some ornaments on it, and a wreath out of flowers, carried it upstairs to the garret window, and let it look out from thence. When all was ready, she got into a barrel of honey, and then cut the feather bed open and rolled herself in it, until she looked like a wondrous bird, and no one could recognize her. Emily's dying. I have so <laughs> many questions right now. <laughs> I just I don't even know how to wrap my brain around. I'm gonna decorate this skull. Gee, you know, all these riches were just too normal. Let's put some- <laughs> Listen, sometimes I'm gonna turn myself into a bird. Sometimes you just wake up and you're like, you know what I'm gonna do today? I'm gonna bedazzle a skull, and then you just do. <laughs> then she went out of the house, and on her way, she met some of the wedding guests, who asked, "Oh, Fitchers, what the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly what they asked. That's exactly what it says right here in this book. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Verbatim. <laughs> that almost came out my nose. <laughs> like, what would you say? They'd never be like, oh, hey, it's you. They'd be like, what the fuck? Cuckoo, I'm a bird. <laughs> Wow, she drank too much wine. (laughs) Jesus. And on her way, she met some of the wedding guests, who asked, O Fitcher's bird, how comest thou here? I come from Fitcher's house quite near. And what may the young bride be doing? From cellar to garret, she's swept all clean. And now from the window, she's peeping, I ween. All right. At last, she met the bridegroom, who was coming slowly back. He, like the others, asked, O Fitcher's bird, how comest thou here? I come from Fitcher's house quite near. And what may the young bride be doing? From cellar to garret, she's swept all clean, and now from the window she's peeping, I ween. The bridegroom looked up, saw the decked-out skull, thought it was his bride, and nodded to her, greeting her kindly. But when he and his guests had all gone into the house, The brothers and kinsmen of the bride, who had been sent to rescue her, arrived. They locked all the doors of the house, that no one might escape, set fire to it, and the wizard and all his crew were burned. The Um, end. That escalated real quickly. That's a very (laughs) abrupt ending. Why did they think that the skull happens to look like her? Because it's pretty. I'm thinking she, like, decorated it in such a way where it looked like her from far away. Okay, so are we talking like Norman Bates' mom in the rocking chair with the wig on kind of thing? I'm thinking something like that. Like, maybe she went into the secret room and was like, you don't need this hair anymore. I'ma borrow this. And then... Ew. Scalp. Yeah. Blech. So, I'm just saying. <laughs> but, Yeah. So the collection I've shared with you today is just a tiny sampling of the truly vast collection of tales that the pair were able to compile over the years. Their efforts to document the oral history of their people, the Hessens, and of those in Germany have left a lasting legacy for not only Germanic folklore, but for folklore in general. By the time Wilhelm died on December 16th, 1859, at the age of 73, Their collection of stories was in its seventh edition of publication and had grown to the size we know it as today, 211 standalone tales, and by then the book also contained elaborate illustrations. Jacob, the older of the pair, died a few years later on September 20th, 1863, at the age of 78. It's said that he never recovered from the death of his brother, who he'd been extremely close to the whole of his life. 
following their deaths, it's believed that their collection of macabre tellings has, to this day, only been outsold by Shakespeare and the Bible. And that is the story of Jacob and Wilhelm, the Brothers Grimm. I love that they went around and compiled all these and tried to keep them as true as possible because they were right. The world was changing and those probably would have been lost if they hadn't written those down. Mm -hmm. That's honestly pretty forward thinking and pretty badass. Mm -hmm. They're fucked up stories, but Mm -hmm. now they entertain us. Yep. (laughs) So I will say that ingredients for these dishes were sourced from biography.com, Britannica.com, famous authors... I think that's a dot com. Grimm's Complete Fairy Tales, published in January 1976 by Nelson Doubleday. Modern Horrors, Wikipedia, and World of Tales. Sometimes when you're poor and no one wants to be your friend and all you do is read books, it works out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Other times it doesn't, and I'm a good example of that, but that's okay. (laughs) You're still young yet. No, no. (laughs) now <laughs> so does anyone have something nice they'd like to share <laughs> <laughs> oh being poor listen life is good for some people probably <laughs> um i guess my good thing is that yesterday was river's birthday yay Happy birthday, She's River. five now. She's right? five years old, and Aww. I gave her toys, and she destroyed a bunch of them already. So that was like, well, it would have been a bloodbath, but since they're fluffy, it was like a stuffing bath. Yeah. <laughs> it was a fluff bath. It was a fluff bath. And I got her like a, I don't want to call it a cake because it's not. I think it's technically a pie. Like, you oh, know, because yeah. they can only put mm-hmm. certain things in dog right. food. Mm-hmm. So I gave her some of that. But for whatever reason, she doesn't seem to like it very much. So I had to put like spray dog peanut butter all over it to get it. <laughs> <laughs> eat it. So struck out on that. Probably won't do that again next year. But she likes, well, she liked the toys. Um, Some of them are still around. Some of them are in the trash already but that's okay <laughs> <Not too much. laughs> that's okay because it's better for those to be in the trash than like my bed <laughs> to mm-hmm. be destroyed or <laughs> a pair of shoes or something so i will take it that's true i i feel like hearing that story after hearing the stories about <laughs> the wizard <laughs> <laughs> <Just picture. laughs> like a bathtub full of all these fluffy <laughs> limbs <laughs> I could make that happen. Just like piece them back together and it'll be a new toy. <laughs> like arms and legs just sticking out and fluff everywhere. I should make like a Franken toy that's like made of all the bits of like pieces of toy that yes. are left over. Yes. But that would be amazing. Let's be honest. I'd have to actually sit here and sew stuff together and that's not going to happen. <laughs> just stay put together like real Frankenstein and then just like display yep. it somewhere. It's a creepy toy that River can never play with. <laughs> <laughs> My dog murdered her toys. <laughs> Look, it's behold, it's Frank and Squeaky. <laughs> oh, that would be amazing. But yeah, so happy birthday, River. You are five. Congratulations. <laughs> five and adorable. Mm hmm. And super destructive, but I love you. What about you, Emily? Um, Well, that kind of makes me think of a pet story that I have. Did I tell you about the mouse? No. I don't think so. So, I'm not, we we can't, we still can't decide whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. (laughs) But, (laughs) like, 1230 at night, we're just starting to fall asleep and we hear this weird sound and i look over the bed and both the cats are just sitting there staring up at us and at their feet i thought i saw one of their little stuffed mice Mm -hmm. but it was not a stuffed mouse it was a real mouse that they were very proudly laying at the foot of our bed like here look what i brought for you behold mistress i have brought forth a carcass to present to you (laughs) they were they were both just looking at us like, see, look what we did. This is for you. <laughs> we are good providers. <laughs> Praise us. 
we couldn't decide whether this was a good, like it's good that they they got it and we we have cats that will take care of that so we don't have to put out mouse traps but on the mm-hmm. other hand that means we have mice yeah <laughs> <laughs> so now i'm really nervous every time they sit and they <laughs> they stare underneath of our stove so i think it lives back under there but uh, i don't know that was our that was our delightful middle of the night now every time they bring me their stuffed mice i'm like huh? Oh no, it's cool. <laughs> mouse PTSD. It's a new fun game. Mouse or carcass. <laughs> you don't know what you're gonna get. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's horrifying. Well, Couldn't be mad at them. Yeah. You can't. Well, in staying with the pet theme, um <laughs> Kona is really good at um if bugs get in the house, like flies and stuff, she'll just kind of like pounce on them and like play with them. She'll like pat it with her paw and then like mouth it a bit <laughs> and then like let it oh, no. and then like let it go. And if it moves some more, she'll like pat it and then eat it for a little while <laughs> and then let it go. Oh god. Oh god. <laughs> Until finally she's like, okay, it's dead. Nom nom nom. And then she'll like finish eating it. And I'm just like, you are a, a king among kings. I love you. <laughs> and apparently the other night she tried to eat a toad outside. Oh, yes. You guys in toads. Welcome to the club. <laughs> yep. <laughs> apparently she got it in her mouth at some point, And then the girls were able to get it out of her mouth or get her to drop it. I like when it's in there and then their saliva gets all foamy from, like, the stuff on the outside of the Uh. toad. And you're like, oh, but you're not going to learn anything from this. (laughs) Yep. And she didn't because the next morning I went to let her out of her crate and she had thrown up everywhere. Yeah. Oh, gross. That also, yeah, that also happens. It depends how long it was in the mouth for. Yep. Yay. Yay for pets being good uh, protectors of the realm. <laughs> I, pi- I picture all of us in very cartoony, like a cartoon frog in that mouth. Like, ah! Then he pops out and he's like, hello, my baby. Hello, hello my honey. Hello, hello, my right, right gal. gal. <laughs> but dripping in saliva. Yeah. And it's like, Completely it's slimed like kick up. dancing away. <laughs> <laughs> Well, shall I share a review? Yes, please. Okay. So before we close the pizzeria for the evening, I'd like to share a review from one of our satisfied patrons. Ladies Fright Podcast shared the following review on Apple Podcasts. And they say, I like pineapple on pizza and you should too. I love how this show talks about some very spooky things, but still has such an upbeat energy. The hosts are very fun and keep you engaged. The topics are well-researched, and the show is very informative. Thank you so much, ladies. Go make us blush. (laughs) We try to know things. Woo. Woo. (laughs) We try. Sometimes we succeed at it. Other times I'm like, I don't know what this word is that I typed into my notes, and that's not good. (laughs) Sometimes I'm like, I don't know how to read English anymore, but it's okay. (laughs) None of my fingers are webbed, so I'm good. So True facts. <laughs> true facts. <laughs> well, on that note, thank you for visiting our beautiful pizzeria and enjoying us. Uh, trying to think of a fun slice thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. The word slice after stories about people being cut up alone <laughs> is like I'm cracking up over here. Okay. And enjoying... Uh, a grim slice. There yeah, we go. A grim go. slice of urban legends and fairy tales and wild cats. <laughs> Apple Pizza Podcast. We're sweet and cheesy. Not everyone understands our awesomeness, but we're glad that you do. Question mark. If you're enjoying the show and you'd like to help support us, check out our Tea Public shop for some amazingly fun and funny merch. Or if you want to do a one-time donation, you can do that on buymeacoffee.com and buy us a fresh slice. Because we can never get enough of basically anything, if we're being honest. If you absolutely love the show and you want to check out some fantastic bonus content, you can become a donor on Patreon and earn all kinds of amazing benefits. 
we have three tiers to accommodate almost any budget. The $3 Mythbuster, $7 Cryptid Hunter, and $15 Storyteller. Become a patron today and start enjoying all the perks and extra content right away. Don't forget, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at PineAppPizzaPod. That's PineAppApp Pizza Pod. You can also send us questions, comments, and topic ideas at PineAppApp Pizza Pod at gmail.com. Remember, there's the two P's in app. Otherwise, you're emailing someone else, and I don't want to be held responsible for that. Thanks for stopping in for some deliciously weird morsels. And just remember, no matter how you slice it, you're awesome. And we love you. 